Hi, I'm Bill Murphy. In addition to being station manager for Hicksville Community Television, I'm also a proud member of the Hicksville Rotary Club. The Rotary meets every week on Tuesday for a nice luncheon, also fellowship, fun, and a featured speaker that talks to the Rotarians about the events of the day or items of interest to the general community. And in a new partnership with Hicksville Community Television, the Hicksville Rotary Club has asked me to bring my camera along to the meetings to share with you some features and highlights of some of the guest speakers that appear at the Hicksville Rotary Club. So that's what this program is all about, and we hope that you enjoy it. Featured speakers from recent meetings of the Hicksville Rotary right here on Hicks TV. Fellow Rotarians and guests, after finding out that I had a program last Tuesday and striking out after about 50 calls, I'm doing what I vowed I would never do, and that is be my own program. So if anybody wants to leave, you're not going to hurt my feelings. <laughs> Hopefully you'll find I knew there was some of them go right away. <laughs> some, of, some of the people have heard some of this and some of it have a little bit, but I've given this at, at various times that I've been asked to speak, and I'll give you a little background a little bit about my career or whatever. I was 17 when I graduated from high school and 17 when I started Ohio State. I went two quarters and quit, but I still have fond memories of Ohio State. But I wasn't there for all these things that happened, Jim, that, you know, haven't been around that long. But what I did do when I quit is I came back and I went to Northwest Tech to start my real estate classes. I just turned 19 and got my real estate license. And then a couple years later, I decided to get a broker's license. So I went back in 21, took more classes, took the exam, got my broker's license. Decided as close as we were to Indiana that it probably is a good idea to get an Indiana license. So at 23, I think, I got my Indiana broker's license. I could take, I didn't have to take more classes, reciprocal agreement. I just had to take the test. And then during this period of time, I'd lost some listings that I hoped to get. And I, the reason that they gave me for not listing with me was because this other realtor had an auctioneer's license and a real estate license. So what was nice about that when they did it, can you hear me okay? When they did it was that when they listed their house, when they sold it, the other realtor could do their auction and they just had one person. I thought, oh, maybe that's a good idea. Get your auctioneer's license. So at 23... I went to uh, Northwest Tech. I just started an auction school. So I went to uh, Northwest Tech. Bill Sig was the instructor. Some of you guys probably knew Bill Sig. Or not Bill Sig, Al Alvin Sig. Not Bill, Alvin, his father. And so I took my auctioneer's exam and uh, took all the tests and passed it. Kind of an interesting note is that uh, a lot of people, I was so dumbfounded, I guess, to hear this question is, is it really true what they say to be an auctioneer that they make you talk with marbles in your mouth? I'd never heard that before, and I said, no, we, we didn't have to talk with marbles. But what they do do, just a little briefly, and I'll tell you this, was in the very beginning when they teach an auctioneer, they'll have you take a number, a dollar amount, so to speak, and then they'll have you use different fill words. The fill words are words that you don't hear typically or understand in between the numbers. All we care is that you understand the numbers, not the fill words. So, in some of the fill words, they might have you take a dollar. Would you give me a dollar? Would you go a dollar? Would you make it a dollar? Would you give me two dollars? Would you go two dollars? Would you make it? And I have to do all this. As time goes on, you would listen to what other people did and some of the fill words, and some of them, and I'll never forget, the one guy, his fill words was, Mama, do you want to buy? <laughs> nobody nobody would want to buy it. And other guys would, Jim, do you want to buy? It didn't mean to make a lot of difference, but it was kind of funny as the guy did it. He would say, Mama, do you want to buy a dollar? Mama, do you want to buy two and a half? Jim, do you want to buy? But when you put it together, nobody could understand it. Be Mama, to buy two and a half. Mama, to buy five. Mama, to buy seven and a half. By the time you shortened it and said it faster, that's how it came out. And so the fun of that is sometimes if somebody shows up in the crowd that I might say, Jeff, do you want to buy? Or Jim, do you want to buy? Or anyone want to buy? But there are a lot of those. And then you find different words. So it was kind of cute learning all that. And some guys came in. One guy came in, Alvin Rupp from over by Archibald. 
and he came in with a cowboy hat and cowboy boots, and man, this guy was ready. He'd been practicing at home, and you could just see him. And they videotaped us in the beginning. And you want to see how dumb you look and how bad you are, is have somebody videotape that in the beginning. But I could still see that man hopping around and doing it. He was just so animated. But it was a fun thing. It was a neat thing to learn, and I've had a lot of fun with it. And over the years, I've done... I helped out the Junior Livestock Auction 32 years. I've done the Amish Christian School Auction for 30-some years. Uh, Ducks Unlimited. I used to remember Doc years ago in the Havers and stuff. Ducks Unlimited. Pheasants Forever. I've done hospice. I've done quite a number of 30 years, over 30 years that I've done volunteered at auction at all these things. But I digress a little bit and I'll go back a little farther before I got that. So I ended up with Ohio Real Estate. Ohio Brokers, Indiana Real Estate, Indiana Auctioneering, and all those licenses by the time I was 23 years old. Now back up a little bit. When I graduated from high school, I knew I was immature, and I still am. But my dad decided, which he didn't too often sit down and get formal about it, dad said, what do you think you want to do? 16 years old, I'm a senior in high school, my dad's asked me what I want to do. Heck, I, I just want to get out of home. I want to quit have to go out the farm and work all the time. So I, one of the things I thought about, I'd always been so proud of my grandparents were both in the World War I, and my dad was in the paratroopers and into World War II, and another cousin that was a tunnel rat and a paratrooper in Vietnam, and I always felt this real sense of patriotism. And what a lot of you don't know, and some of you do know, this was Vietnam era. And so one of the things I thought I wanted to do was possibly join the military, the service, and kind of travel a little bit while I grew up and matured a little bit. And my dad about went nuts. I mean, he essentially said, what kind of idiot are you? If you want to see the world, go get a job and go see their young. You're not going to tell them where you want to travel. You don't know what you're asking for. So I guess I didn't do so well there. So he asked me again, what else are you thinking about doing? And I told my dad, I'll never forget this, I said, Dad, I think I want to sell real estate. With no hesitation, my dad said, so you want to be a crook too, huh? <laughs> I mean, I'm old for two. You know, the only thing I could thought was maybe the priesthood that might have been okay, but he wouldn't have believed that. So anyways, I, I took the real estate courses and I did all this, and when I was... 23, I wasn't real happy. I started out uh, with Billy Drillers, with Corinne and her and I, and things weren't... I sold more than everybody in the office, but I just wasn't real happy there. And so I was trying to decide if this really what I wanted to do or what was next. And you talk about influential people in your life or people that you talk to. A lot of guys, you will remember Wendell Savage. Well, Wendell Savage, I bought that building when I was 21 on the corner. And Wendell Savage rented from me. And I kind of throw a little humor in this with too. And so I'm talking to Wendell one day as I'm collecting rent. And, and uh, I said, told Wendell I was thinking about maybe switching my license or doing something. And he said, why do you want to do that for? If you can sell for someone else, you can sell for yourself. And I really, you know, it's probably true. And I had some brokers in Defiance that said if I ever decided to leave, they would consider opening a branch office in Nixville and having me run that office. So, long story short, I decided I would open my own office. So, when I left Village Realty, I was 23 and turned 24 November 4th. I quit in the end of October, turned 24, and was opened up by the end of the month on my own real estate company at age 24, which I would not suggest to any young person in their life to do it. But it's kind of like why they send kids off to war when you're young because you think you're Superman and, and you're not afraid of anything. And that's kind of <clears throat> the way it was with me starting in real estate. I thought I need a calculator, I need a file cabinet, probably some pens and pencils. You know, how much do I need to get this started? Jeez, OP. <clears throat> so anyways, I started it anyways, and, and it's kind of history, I guess, since then. But one of the things is anybody in relation, any here related to Mid Savage, Okay, good. Then I'll fuck it. Is this being recorded for all of posterity here? <laughs> I gotta tell you some funny stories, and I know Turks heard this. 
But when I when I bought the building and decided I wanted to start my own real estate business, uh, Rod Arthur, the attorney from Defiance, had an office and rented in there, and Wendell Savage was in the front, and then I was going to take this other office. There were going to be three of us in there for the time being, because Wendell wanted to stay there at least through the tax season in May. This is November. So uh, I put in a phone system. The deal was they could stay there, but Midge would answer the phone for me, and I had three lines for everybody, so if anybody called, she'd answer it, you know, take messages and stuff. And uh, I came back one day after being out, probably trying to drum up business, and when I got back, uh, Mitch said, uh, while you're gone, the phone just rang and rang and rang, but I was too busy typing, and I didn't get a chance to answer it. <laughs> Wow, I wonder who might have called, you know what I mean. And uh, another one of my favorite ones, when I came back one time, she said, why are you gone? The phone rang and a man called. <laughs> I was waiting for the rest of this. That, those were the whole messages. I thought, my God, I'm never going to make it in this business. I've got to find another arrangement. These are true stories. There's another one I won't even share that... At this point, man, I couldn't wait for May to come and get them out of there so I could get my office back. Then I found out that they owned the baseboards in there and I had to buy those. And then it was so hot in there that I put up curtains and I came back and Midge wanted to know why I put those sissy-looking curtains up. <laughs> oh, man, I'm not doing very well here. But anyways, we got started and we did this and, and uh, it's now been over 41 years. And there have been a lot of changes. Uh, and people ask you, like, what? And you see it in every one of your businesses, the changes. And, of course, the Internet, the multiple listing service and everything. It used to be, and I was just going over this with somebody today, in the old days when you listed a property, you put an ad in the paper and you put a sign out front, and somebody called and said, I see there's a sign out there. What can you tell me about it? We think we'd like to look at it. Or they saw something in the paper, but that was it. The only way they knew, really, was to go through the house. And so you tried to talk about, should you reduce if the home wasn't selling, what do you do? And of course, I'm kind of learning all this the hard way, as you might imagine. The difference is now, it would take us back then about two weeks to get a property on the market. You met with the people, you told them what you thought it was worth. But if you tried to shift, tell them what properties you're comparing it to, because in an appraisal, and my appraisal schooling that I took, you basically find a property that's similar to yours that is sold in the last three to four months that's similar in size, condition, and location. Well, where do you think you found that information? It was either one of your properties you sold or you got in a car and drove to the courthouse and started trying to look through records. And I talk about tedious and not understanding. The people at the courthouse were pretty good at trying to be a help to you. The difference is now is with the multiple listing service, which is pretty recent in our area, now we can go to the computer. Defiance County, we have our six county board. Putnam, Paulding, uh, Defiance, William Henry, Fulton. All those counties, if you know, the population on, there might be one or two that are now over 40,000, but most of them are between 30 and 40,000. It's not enough population to have your own multiple listing service. So some realtors were pretty good if you called them up and say, hey, have you sold anything in this range or whatever, sharing information? Some were definitely going to go out of the way not to help you. So a number of years back, some of the older brokers, that, uh, those of us that had been in business longer, found out that we could join the Toledo Board of Realtors and for a fee that we could have access to all that. And we did it, a core group of us started that thing, and pretty soon, now I think everybody, there might be a couple of people that are licensed brokers that aren't full-time in real estate that don't belong to, but now we have all that at our fingertips. If I was to list Ken Klein's home, what we could do, we'd go to the auditor's office, we'd pull up his square foot, his age, and everything about his home, then we'd go to the multiple listing service and we'd punch in one-story homes and this square foot, this acreage, or whatever, and how many sold. And now, because the economy is so bad, you can't go back the last three or four months. You might not find any. So now you might go back three or four years. But now we can punch that in and find every one-story home 
in the Hicksville School District that sold, and then we can print those out and show them, Ken, these are all the ones that sold. Let's see which one compares most favorably with yours or whatever. And you can do that in, in, in land, commercial property. It was tougher because that isn't always reported. And in residential real estate sales. Where again, in the old days, when I went to your house, I gathered the information. I bought a Polaroid land camera, went out, took a picture, watched it develop, had a blank form that we got from a company called E.H. Hemager in Kokomo, Indiana. We typed that information on it, mailed it to him, and about a week or so later, we got back a package of listing, a package of fact sheets on that house. If you made any change, you imagine how difficult it was trying to cross them off, erase, use white out, do everything else if you reduced prices or did anything. Now, we can list it and do everything in one day. The fact of the matter is, in the Toledo Board of Realtors, if you don't have all that information downloaded in five days from the day you listed it, you get fined. And if your sign shows up in the picture in the front of the house, you get fined. I still don't understand that one. There's a lot of other things you get fined for with them. But the nice part about it is, is now your information is shared everywhere. If I listed Doc Ramos's house, there would be everybody, I mean, that information would be available immediately. There would probably be a dozen to 20 photos of it. So now you, vir you can take a virtual tour before you ever got to the house. So you know all this information. That's the difference between now and then. Before, you know, a lot of times we told people, if you didn't have five or six showings on your house, if nobody made an offer, maybe you consider it. Now, and I'm going to tell you another reason why, now there could be a hundred people or more that have seen your home before anyone ever came to look at it. Now here's a part that's really, really neat with the multiple listing service. If Don Brown came to me and he said, Bruce, here's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a one-story home. I don't want a real big one, you know, maybe 1,500 square feet. I don't want it to be more than 30 years old. I don't want cable electric heat. I want a forced air system with central air. If you get anything like that, let me know. Anybody that has an email address, we can put you in a search immediately. Now, the more detailed you are, if you tell me you have to have geothermal, you imagine you're probably not going to get many things sent to you. But you can put people in a search with an email address and put it in here, and any listing that any realtor has in the school district that you put in, I can put you in in three different school districts. We sometimes have people come in from out of town they're going to work at Fort Wayne. They say, Antler, Pixel, or Edgerton. I want to be near the state line. I'll take a one story in the country with a basement, the maximum of this price, anywhere in these three border towns. We can put in a search, and it doesn't matter who lists it, it will send an email. If it's Grell, Straley, Schweitzer, Coldwell Bankers, everyone, it will send an email directly to you. So it's really, really nice. I keep a cheap sheet, cheap cheat sheet of everybody that I'm looking for properties. I'll write it down, possible listings, looking for certain type of properties that I'll glance at pretty regular. But the neat part is I can't forget them. So now imagine this. Of all the realtors around, if they're doing this, which are crazy if they don't, when they list your home, everybody that says, I'll look at Antwerp and Hicksville, if your home fits that criteria, it's gone out to them. So you're getting everybody's stuff sent out to you. So now, I truly believe that if they showed your home three or four times, and if nobody made you an offer, that might not be too early to consider reducing already. Because you don't even know how many people looked at that, essentially did a video or tour of your house, and already knew about it. They don't have to do it the old days. Now they can pull it all up by truly Zillow, Google, Realtor.com, I mean, there's so many search engines and they can pull your information up. So it's out there all the time. And then the other part about it, in essence, and this I, I believe is really, really important and really true, and it's kind of one of those duh statements, but it's true. In selling your house, you have two things to deal with. You have two things to work with your options, condition and price. 
if your condition is mint or very good and your home hasn't sold, what else have you got to, to use to sell your home? You got one other thing and that's price. So the idea is to have your home in as mint, as good a condition as you can. If it's not selling, you got one other thing to deal with. And that's it. And that's your price. If it's not selling, then it's up to you. What's your motivation? Do you want, you don't mind owning it for a year, paying taxes, insurance, utilities, snow care, lawn care, then everything else? If you want to be, and I hesitate to use the word bullheaded, but if you want to be firm enough that you're going to hold out till you get that price, that's fine, but you're probably going to lose money to get it. What it allows us to do, much like everybody else's business, it allows us to adjust to the market, to react to the market much quicker than ever before. And you look at these now, when you pick up a flyer, if I print you one off from the MLS, there's three letters at the bottom say D-O-M. It means days on the market. When you're pulling up comp comparable sales and you're seeing 300, 200 and some D-O-M, do you want to take that long to sell your home? If you don't, maybe we need a different strategy. There's so many things like this that have changed in the real estate market. Now we have continuing education. You have to take continuing education in Ohio, 30 hours every three years. Uh, and some of that's changed. I might have to have Turk remind me on some of this. In Indiana, now they change it to 24 hours. 24 hours every two years. In Indiana auctioneering, I have to take 16 hours every two years and the only thing we don't have to take continued education on right now is Ohio auctioneering and you pick up some stuff but it's a pain in the rear the good news is that we can take a lot of stuff online what they've tried to do is they've really tried to professionalize it more and more errors and omissions insurance all companies most companies carry errors and omissions insurance which is pretty expensive there's a lot of stuff that's really, really changed, and like everything else, I mean, technology has been a good part of it. It's, it's a, it can be a pain in the rear, but a good part. A lot of people in auctions are using uh, the computer to clerk their entire sale, and I'm still a little scared of it. I remember one time when I was gone, and my guy sold two tables worth of stuff, and they didn't even have a clerk walking with them. <laughs> well, that's kind of scary to explain to people. The people so good, they said, who bought this and who bought that? And everybody came forward and they told them and, and wrote it down. But you worry that what if you got any kind of computer glitch or whatever? I'm a little concerned about the online things. When things go well, great. But what if they don't? What if they don't pay? What if they don't? There's so many what ifs, what ifs, what ifs. If I get into that, I'll probably do a backup system and I'll pay double for the clerking just to try to keep track of that type of stuff. Last thing I guess people ask a little bit about in that is well, a couple things. One thing is just like the farms. We're doing farms. I had a guy in there this morning for about a half hour asking me, what do you think about these farm values? Have we seen the top of it, the bottom of it, what's what? If I could answer that honestly, and, and uh, I'd probably be somewhere else, working somewhere else. It's so difficult. We see things, we get information like through the bank that we pay attention to everywhere. You're looking at grain prices, you're looking at changes and how it all, how it all factors in. They changed depreciation for farmers and farm equipment, what they could do. Jim can tell you about that. It's changing a lot of grain prices, where grain prices are, where interest rates are. All these different factors go in and it's very, very difficult. It's very difficult to be, to be confident in the appraisal that you give people in farmland. For those of you who have been around before, that you remember what we saw a lot of you guys do, what we saw with uh, land prices in the 80s, and even prior to that, what happened to it. And it's kind of scary. And you worry right now that people are overextending themselves uh, with this land keep going up and up and up. We see land prices around here selling 85 to 9,500 on good land. I sold a farm a couple years ago out here, and I sold a parcel for 10,125. If you step across the line in Indiana with the Amish, there was a farm just across the state line that was about 70% tillable. I mean, it was decent ground. It just sold for 10,000 an acre, you know, right across. And the Amish in some of those areas are paying 15 to 20,000 an acre. 
if you're in the right church or group over there in your land, I mean, you'll, they'll pay fifteen to twenty thousand an acre. You know, it's a little different over here. But I don't know. I kind of think that what we're going to see yet this fall, I think we're still going to, I don't think we're going to see the drop yet, but I've had people on the board of directors at Archbold Equipment. And I've had people at John Deere Corporation, different ones I talked to. A lot of them think in a couple of the next two or three years they're going to see some crashes. I'm not so sure. But it's scary. It's tough. Do we sell our farm, our family farm that we've had forever? Do we sell that now? Is this the top of the market? I can't tell you, but I know this, that I know that if you look at your return, we used to figure, I used to figure that on our land that we owned, that we didn't farm ourselves, that we were getting about a 2% return on. Now going back a number of years, none of us would have been too happy with the 2% return. Now with the real estate taxes that have gone up so high, I don't, I'm not... I think on most years, you're probably lucky if you get a 2% return because of real estate tax. And I knew this was going to happen on the farms because you could have a $350,000 home and pay $4,500 to 5000 a year in real estate taxes. But if you had a $350,000 farm, you're paying six to $800 in real estate taxes. There's a lot more people in the urban areas than there are in the rural areas. It's just a matter of time when they were going to figure out that there's a lot of money left out there in taxes that somebody can spend if they raise those, and that's what they did. They raised them considerably, many times, four times, five times what taxes were, six times even some on farms. That changes the whole perspective on your rate of return. You know, but then you have to look at, I don't have any work to do, I don't have to worry about bad renters, domestic disputes, people sneaking in dogs and cats and all the other stuff, but... It makes the decision tough, so it's pretty hard to answer those people. All you can do is tell them what it looks like to you. But I won't go on any longer. Does anybody have any questions? Anything I can answer? I've had a lot of fun in it, really, in the years. Some years have been more fun. When the economy's bad, it's not as much fun as when we had those good years in the real estate. Day in and day out, it's still what I like doing the most. I don't know how much longer, but probably, probably another eight, nine years. Any other questions? If not, thank you for listening. I hope you had a couple laughs through the whole thing. Thank you. Thanks, Bruce. Secretary, 
And my wife Nancy helps. We don't have any other help. I have to pull strings to get them. I thought, like in 2000 when I was going to retire, I thought I volunteered to take over the treasure. I thought it'd be just paperwork. What do I just paperwork? I have to buy everything, take in for everything, haul it. See that it's at the, at the proper place and everything. So I did that started in 2001. And basically after that, I have nobody to help. I have to recruit help. That's one thing I always tell everybody, I always carry the checkbook with me. Just waiting for somebody to bad mouth me because they're going to take over. <laughs> uh, we always meet the first, we try to meet the first one of every month, but we don't get any takers. So basically, sometimes Pete and I and my wife will meet at our house. Uh, one of the things you probably want to know how we raise money for the boosters. And this money is used all the way through the grade schools, all the way up to our senior class. We try to help them all out. But the first thing we do is we always go through the athletic department first. If they need something, an athletic team needs something, they have to go through the athletic department, then they'll come to us, and then we'll try to help them. One of the things that we've done at that time is, over the years, when we have a football concession, a basketball concession, the athletic department will schedule an athletic team to work the concessions. That's to sell the product. But to prepare the product, to sell, to fix the chicken, the hot dogs, get the popcorn going and everything, we hire a class. A class or a team to prepare that, to get it ready prepared to sell. And usually all the time is, uh, usually get, I think one time I had a, a senior class, actually they did it for seven straight years, which had no burps in it whatsoever because they knew what they were doing. But they usually go down there, like for a football game, these people would go down there about five o'clock, sometimes earlier, start popping popcorn, getting it ready, depending on the opponent, getting the hot dogs on, getting the chicken ready to go, making sure the candy is out, the coolers are filled and everything, so that they can sell that product to the, to the customer. Another way of raising money we have here is besides the football and boys basketball, we do the same thing in girls basketball. Girls basketball is a little different. The athletic department does not get us any workers for girls basketball. I was told way back when that it doesn't amount to anything, so you probably don't even want to do it. It's wrong. We do do it, and we do do okay for our various uh, functions that we want to do. Girls basketball, here lately I've had the band boosters do the girls basketball. They prepare the food, they even man the, the uh, selling of it. Another thing that we have is uh, on the football side of it, we have JV football and junior high football. Those game, home games, the cheerleaders, I pay the cheerleaders, they earn their money that they need to for the year to do those home games. They do a nice job. Uh, also with those football games and boys basketball, we run a 50-50 rifle. Another thing that we have, that I'm going to pass around here, is and it has the Hicksville Athletic Boosters philosophy and purpose right here, is we sell this program. We get a lot of you people, new businesses, advertising us. At one time, I, want, I still want to is get around to all you people and let you see the advertisement, give you a copy of this so you can see where your $100 donation is going or your $50 donation is going to. So I'm going to pass this around. You may look at that. That is this year's program. I have another one here that I can pass around. This is game three. I have all my stats and everything in here. The pencil stats, the, I think I have all of them in here. So those are the sports programs. And then also, another fundraiser that we have is the community calendar. 
this at one time. By the way, the Tribune printed Princeton's programs up for us. Before they used to be farmed out, it's not farmed out, we use it local. Same with this here program, way back when it was done outside of Hicksville, it is now done by the News Tribune. This is the community calendar. This community calendar, we usually have a, a team or uh, some kind of school function up here. It shows all the advertising. This has all the athletic events, all of your per birthdays, anniversaries are on here. You can put meetings on here. All you got to do is get a hold of Jan, helpful finger. She'd be glad to do this for you. But this is a, this is last year's. It comes out in January of each year. Also at the uh, football games, you might see the group of guys down here in the corner. They prepare hamburgers and broths and sausage sandwiches. That's one of the things. Last year, these young guys took it over for me and said, Jack, don't worry about this. We're going to take care of it. Don't even worry about this. They, went, they go to Kenny's or they go and get the hamburger. I don't know where they get it. I just give me a bill and I'll pay it. Uh,
<laughs> Athletic Boosters built a 40 by 24 extension to the pool bathhouse. If you look at the bathhouse, that should be on the right hand side of it. If you look at it. This is to be used as a dressing room for the football, track, and baseball games, plus storage for the park board. When complete, it becomes property of the village. Low Applegate, President, August 15, 1965. Hicks TV and the Hicksville Rotary hopes that you've enjoyed this program, again featuring some of the featured speakers that appear at the Hicksville Rotary Club's weekly meetings. If you'd like to find out more about becoming a member of Rotary, it's as easy as asking a local Rotary member. And we hope that you'll join us again soon for more highlights from the Hicksville Rotary Club right here on Hicks TV.